My name is Amanda and I am the Regional Workshops Project Coordinator for NCD Child. NCD Child is a global multi-stakeholder coalition championing the rights and needs of children, adolescents, and young people who are living with or at risk of developing non-communicable diseases. Next slide, please. I would like to thank AstraZeneca Young Health Program for their ongoing support. And I would also like to thank our excellent partners and co-hosts, the Asia Pacific Pediatric Association and Caring and Living as, neighbor, and, as Neighbors. Prof Aman, I will ask you to thank participants on behalf of APA now. Uh, thank you, Amanda. I think it's a great honor for us, uh, Asia Pacific Pediatric uh, Association, to have collaboration with NCD Child and CLAN. Yeah, I think, uh, especially during this pandemic, uh, we have to be aware and concerned about the impact of COVID-19 uh, to obesity and diabetes in Asia Pacific region. I think this workshop uh, would be a lot of benefit because all of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, treatment and everything will be something during the pandemic. So thank you again, NCD Child. Thank you again, all speakers. Thank you again, Clan. And of course, thank you for all participation. Of course, for, for all participants. Yes, you all going to be a champion, agent of change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aman. Kate, if you are still on the call, we would love for you to give. Uh, some remarks on behalf of CLAN. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda. Thanks, Prof. Aman. Um, well, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm dialing in from the lands of the Wallamadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present, uh, acknowledging um, everybody calling in from around the Asia Pacific region and acknowledging the elders that we have here on the, on the line today in the field of child health. Uh, we have a lot of experts on the, on, on the um, webinar, a lot of fantastic speakers lined up, but um, particularly really want to also acknowledge the role of youth, young people. And uh, thank you, NCD Child, for the great work you do, championing young, young people. And Arthur as well, with the young, the next generation of um, pediatricians coming through who will make such a difference. And also the youth advocates on the line. Um, so thanks, Amanda. Thanks for the great work. Look forward to it. Thank you, Kate. So we'll quickly run through our agenda for today. We've just had our opening remarks on behalf of APA and CLAN, and we are going to hear from our keynote speaker shortly through a video message. We will then move on to our panel discussion and Q&A session, and then this will be followed by two breakout sessions. Finally, we'll come back for a report back and some reminders for tomorrow. So. Before we get started and we uh, move into the keynote, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Please feel free to come on camera, but ensure that you are on mute. Today's opening keynote and plenary panel are being recorded and we will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues. We will also invite your comments and questions after our panel. Please use the chat box to submit your questions and we will try to address all of the questions time permitting. I would now like to turn it over to Annie Sanchez. Annie is a PhD candidate at Lehigh University studying the biology behind specific developmental diseases called cohesinopathies. Her research focuses on understanding the genetic pathway that leads to congenital abnormalities. Annie currently serves as one of the United Nations Youth Representatives for CLAN. Annie is also an Indigenous woman from Ecuador who is on the board of Indigenous NCDs, an organization seeking to promote the voices of Indigenous people within the global NCD community. Annie will be introducing our keynote speaker and moderating our plenary panel today. Annie, the floor is yours. Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody, depending on where you are. 
Uh, my name is Annie, and like mentioned, I'm an indigenous woman from Ecuador, but I currently live in the United States. Um, I would just like to start off by acknowledging the original caretakers of the land in which I am in, the Lenape people, and the land in which I am from, the Quechuan people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, so today I'm attending this event as a participant of CLAN, um, as well as Indigenous NCDs. And as mentioned, Indigenous NCDs is an indigenous controlled movement seeking to promote the voices of indigenous people's experiences within the global NCD community. Although indigenous people make up 5% of the global population, they account for about 15% of the extreme poor. The Asia Pacific region is home to the largest indigenous, the largest number of indigenous people, and they make up 70% of the total indigenous population in the world. The environmental changes and destructions that, to natural resources have destroyed many of the crucial resources that, uh, that make up the traditional life of indigenous people. Indigenous people are currently experiencing a, transi a transition from a traditional lifestyle to adjust for the changing lands landscapes. This rapid change in lifestyle and dietary patterns mixed with the high poverty rates has led to an increase in prevalence of NCDs within the indigenous communities. Uh, in fact, in studies in the Asia Pacific region showed that indigenous people are two and even three times more likely to have diabetes than their non-indigenous counterparts. So even with this disproportionate burden of NCDs in the indigenous communities, indigenous people are often underrepresented in medical decisions and in decision-making roles. So meaningful inclusion and acknowledgement of indigenous people and their experiences with NCDs needs to be addressed in all NCD movements. Accessible and inclusive language um, on prevention uh, and treatments need to be provided to all communities. So I hope that everybody here today joins me in advocating for indigenous voices to be included in the global NCD discourse um, so can they, they can be active participants in their own health. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, thank you so much for the opportunity of speaking on behalf of indigenous NCDs. And we have some wonderful speakers today. Uh, first, we will hear a recorded message from Mr. Budi Gunadi Sadikin, the Minister of Health of Indonesia. Mr. Sadikin graduated from Bandog Institute of Technology with a degree in nuclear physics in 1988. He began his career as the Information Technology Officer at IBM, Asian Pacific Headquarters in Tokyo, Japan. Prior to becoming the Minister of Health in 2020, Mr. Sadikin was the Group Chief Executive Officer of Mining Industry Holding Company. Today, he also heads the National Economic Recovery and Transformation Task Force amidst the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. Mr. Sadikin has completed executive education at the Harvard Business School, University of California, Berkeley, and Stanford Graduate School of Business, among others. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to deliver, on behalf of the government of the Republic of Indonesia, a keynote speech at this very important forum. I would like to first congratulate the NCD child, along with the Asia Pacific Patriotic Associations and Caring and Living as Neighbors for the excellent arrangement for this regional workshop. I believe all the participants will have exciting and fruitful sessions during this event. Ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, Obesity is associated with numerous health problems. Having obesity puts people at risk for many other serious and costly chronic diseases, as well as increases the risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Globally, overweight and obesity has become a major public health concern. In Asia Pacific, obesity rate among children and adolescents varied widely between the high of 16% in New Zealand, followed by Brunei Darussalam, and the low of 2% in Nepal and India, where the prevalence of underweight was also high among adolescents. Meanwhile, in Indonesia, studies indicated the number of overweight adults has doubled over the past two decades. Similarly, childhood obesity is also on the rise with one in five children aged 5 to 12 years old and one in three adults in Indonesia being overweight or obese, according to the 2018 National Basic Health Research Survey. Obese children are also at greater risk of becoming obese adults. 
Obesity and diabetes rates in Indonesia are increasing rapidly in both rich and poor households as they shift from traditional diets toward processed products that are often higher in fat and sugar and less expensive than wholesome foods. People living in urban areas are more likely to be overweight as access to processed food is easier. City living is also associated with more sedentary lifestyles due to inadequate infrastructure, such as narrow pavements and a lack of parks which limit opportunities for exercising. Distinguished participant, in a study of COVID-19 cases, patients aged 18 years old and younger having obesity and diabetes was associated with a three times higher risk of hospitalizations and a 1.4 times higher risk of severe illness, such as intensive care unit admissions, invasive mechanical ventilation, or death when hospitalized. Given how dramatically COVID-19 pandemic has affected food system, the economy and children's daily life over the past two years, the pandemic potentially amplified trends in childhood obesity. School closures and lockdown have restricted access to physical activity times for children. Strained household finance increased screen time and marketing of fast food potentially drive children to gain more weight. Ladies and gentlemen, the rise in childhood obesity and diabetes and its potential serious long-term impact on public health have underscored the need of tackling obesity and diabetes as part of the pandemic recovery. Comprehensive policy packages are needed to tackle obesity and diabetes effectively. Neighborhood design, access to healthy, affordable foods and beverage, and access to safe and convenient places for physical activity can all impact obesity. As children return to school, these institutions could play an even important role in delivering healthy nutrition and physical activity education. This also allows greater collaborations between education and health sectors in supporting children development. The COVID-19 pandemic provides us opportunity to rethink priorities of health to protect children and adolescents. Non-communicable disease requires multi-sectoral approach and engaged community. Therefore, Indonesia already issued numerous of policy for prevention strategies, such as GERMAS or Healthy Lifestyle Movement, GENTAS and CERDIC. Such strategies encourage health-oriented policies and creating a supportive environment for people to live healthy. The multi-sectoral collaborations involve comprehensive roles from central and local government, professionals, academic organizations, industry, private, community, and media to play an active role in health efforts. The community are also empowered to raise their awareness and take decisions in having healthy behavior, such as screening or early detections, and buy their own resources and ensure the availability of services for early detections, supported by teleconsultations and telemedicine services. Ladies and gentlemen, I have high expectations. This workshop will benefit the Asia-Pacific region by providing opportunity for individuals to strengthen their advocacy and leadership skill, collaborate on prevention strategies and discuss actions to keep young people living with obesity and or diabetes safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much to the Minister uh, Satikin for those insightful statistics um, and the importance of addressing obesity in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. I will now turn it over to the plenary panel. Um, so for the panel today, we have Dr. I, will, um, I would like to first remind the audience that they can submit questions to the chat. Um, and I will now introduce the panel members and then open it up for their opening statement. 
Um, so we have today Dr. Jamal Raza is a pediatrician, pediatric endocrinologist and the executive director at the Singh Institute of Child Health and Neonatology in Pakistan. Previously, he was the executive director at the National Institute of Child Health in Pakistan for 11 years. He currently serves as the president-elect of the Pakistan Pediatric Association and was a past governing council member of NCD Child. Dr. Raza has over 50 publications in peer-reviewed journals. We also have Pat Feldman, who is a broadcaster and marketing executive, serves on various community groups and not-for-profit charitable trust boards. Pat studied media arts and graduated from Waikato Institute of Technology and went on to work in commercial, iwi, and community radio for almost 10 years as an on-air announcer and executive producer. Currently, he is at the National Marketing Manager at Accounting and Audit Firm, RSM, a role Pat has had for two years. In addition to his role, Pat serves as a board member for Diabetes Foundation, Aitoroa, Maori Touch, New Zealand, and is a member of the Institute of Directors, NC. Born in Rotora, Pat is of Maori, Cook Islands, and Pakeha descent. Pat has wakapapa links to Ngati Maru Ki Taranaki through his mom, and Mangai in the Cooks Island through his dad. And last but not least, we have Dr. Louise Barr, who holds the chair of Child and Adolescent Health, who is the chair of the Child and Adolescent Health at the University of Sydney, and is a senior consultant pediatrician at the Sydney's Children's Hospital Network, where she is an active member of Weight Management Services, a clinical service for children and adolescents affected by moderate to severe obesity. Dr. Louise Barr has made research contributions in many aspects of child and adolescence obesity, covering prevention, management, complications, and approaches to health service delivery. She is director of the Australian NHMRC Center of Research Excellence in the Early Prevention of Obesity in Childhood. Dr. Barr is president-elect of the World Obesity Foundation, an international NGO representing professional associations and patients advocacy groups from over 70 countries. She is also a founding fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences. And in 2010, Louise was made a member of the Order of Australia for service for, to medicine and the community. Uh, so after that introduction of this very impressive panel, I would like to open it up for your opening remarks. Uh, first, if do Dr. Rasa, you could go first. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I'm really thankful for the invitation and uh, really happy to join this very important session, which I think will highlight uh, some of the aspects. Of course, we'll not be able to cover everything, but it will highlight some of the very important aspects uh, that has uh, hit the region. I mean, it hit globally and hit the region, especially with, with COVID. Uh, so let me go through some slides on, uh, on, on type 1 diabetes. Next slide. OK, the key question during the pandemic uh, regarding the diabetes was that uh, these three, four, uh, four, five things that, that are highlighted. Uh, first of all, is there an increased incidence of the type 1 diabetes uh, during COVID because we uh, all know that there, it has been linked with, uh, with the type 2 diabetes. So the question was whether or not type 1 diabetes is also associated. Then we looked at the occurrence of the ketoacidosis, both in the newly diagnosed and previously diagnosed patients. Um, what is the glycemic control <clears throat> look like during lockdown? Uh, what is the disease severity? And what other contributing factors are affecting the diabetes control? And finally, what's the role of the telemedicine? Next slide. So there's been some uh, evidence both supporting and countering the fact that there has been an increased incidence of type 1 diabetes. Uh, recently, uh, this very large study from the US has, has uh, quoted that uh, there has been a significant increase in the newly onset diabetes and as uh, this is a multi-central trial that occurred in the US and it has shown a significant p-value uh, of rising the number of cases during the pandemic. Next slide. However, there has been the reports otherwise and there have been uh, reports published by Tittle and Rebon both in diabetes care in 2020 which do not 
suggest the the rise in the acute cases of type one uh, diabetes. Uh, so it, it more or more suggested that there has been uh, a major problem with the delay in the diagnosis rather than the increased incidence of the new cases, which lead to more severe disease and often ketoacidosis. So the conflicting data is right now existing. And I think as the pandemic resolves, we will have a much better understanding and, and a clear uh, indication of whether or not there has been a higher, true higher report of, of cases with type one. Next slide. So as far as the occurrence of uh, ketoacidosis is concerned, although there are more, uh, there, there's been loads of publication on, on ketoacidosis and type one diabetes during the pandemic. And although the majority uh, is suggesting, and it makes sense because uh, the same mechanism of uh, T helper cells is, is uh, or producing the cytokines is responsible for the uh, damage in, in, in ketoacidosis or onset or severity of ketoacidosis. So it will make more sense to, uh, to expect that ketoacidosis will, will be present at a higher rate. And that has been shown in a number of studies However, which have been pointed out here on, on, on the right column in the green. Uh, however, if you can see that there are some other studies also, which have shown that uh, the incidence of ketoacidosis is, is almost the same. Uh, next slide. If you look at the glycemic control, of course, there has been, this has uh, hit a major impact. And uh, one of the initial ISPAD surveys that was published in, in May 20 has shown that only 16% uh, continued the face-to-face -face consultation. Now this is, and this has been pretty much representative of, of a large uh, portion or a large segment of the uh, COVID-19 situation because the lockdowns have been there, it has been, there's been new wave, the, the Delta variant and the other variants. And off and on, uh, we've seen in Australia, in UK, in India, in Pakistan, that there has been episodes where we have been complete lockdown and partial lockdowns. And of course, that has affected the diabetic consultation or children with diabetes bringing to the health facilities in a major way. And uh, as far as that is concerned, of course, that will compromise the glycemic control of, of children. Uh, especially in the underprivileged areas. Next slide. <clears throat> when looking at the disease severity, um, of course, it has been shown that uh, the T helper cells, uh, which is uh, producing a beneficial effect in this situation. Initially, uh, a lot of data came out that there has been a higher incidence or the higher severity of, of uh, people with suffering from diabetes but the type ones were very small in numbers during those uh, studies that were published. And only later when people started dissecting the type ones from type two, they realized that uh, the severity is not so much in, in type one. And also the type ones or it, because it's occurring in, in, the, in the lower age groups in children and in adolescents and young adults, they were already uh, have some kind of a protection or the or the disease was manifesting more in the older age group. So they were protected in that way. And they were also protecting through their immune mechanism. So we fortunately did not have the same severity or the higher heightened severity uh, in, in type one diabetes as we did in the type two. Next one. But of course, there are a number of other factors that have affected children with COVID and, and type ones with COVID. And of course, this has to do with, uh, which actually has affected everybody. The psychosocial stress has affected communities in large and population at large, but also has in enhanced influence on uh, children suffering from diabetes because the parents were concerned about care and uh, there has been problems with social distancing, with isolation, there have been number of deaths in the families of each individual, if not immediate ones, then at least in the extended family that has had its impact uh, on, on children themselves and their care also. Uh, clearly, the lack of physical activity by the closure of gyms, the closure of public areas has had a very adverse influence 
on the on the uh, on the exercise level, and of course has its effect on not just diabetes, but of course the last one is the obesity. And closure of a school has been also very adverse, both in terms of development of the child, social interaction, and other care. So all in all, a great effect in in various dimensions. Next slide. Uh, this is the Pakistan situation, and uh, we were fortunate in many ways that the impact of uh, COVID has been somehow, we really don't understand it as yet fully, uh, but very fortunate that, showed that has, it has not affected Pakistan in the way that we feared it might, because the, there's a huge population, there's a large population with very poor access to, to health care, and of course, the limited resources that we have in our hand. Uh, so if it, if it got out of hand, like in many other countries, uh, it would have been a disaster. But fortunately, we did not have a huge number of cases, 1.2 million and um, 28,300 deaths. This is a few days old figure, but pretty much the same. The, the third wave, the Delta wave is now almost at the end. Uh, so that way we have been fortunate. Next slide. Uh, this is our own data uh, from the National Institute of Child Health. Uh, we have about uh, 1,900, about 2,000 diabetic children registered with us since 2015. And we looked at the uh, incidence of the ketoacidosis. And uh, we did not see a huge increase uh, in, in our own cases. Uh, well, we suspect or we fear. Uh, that some of the, them may not be able to uh, read. Oh, yeah. oh. And uh, no, no, no. actual numbers may have been higher than what has been reported here. Uh, but all in all, this is the situation. So I'll stop here. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion and, and learn from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Raza. Uh, definitely very uh, interesting statistics about ketoacidosis or uh, the increase of incidence of type 1 diabetes, uh, delay in diagnosis, all of those are really important to address uh, during the pandemic. Uh, next, I would like to turn it over to Pat Spellman for your opening remarks. Kia ora, uh, kia ora na. Talo falava, malo, balavinaka, whakalo falahi atu. Warm Pacific greetings from uh, here in uh, Aotearoa uh, to New Zealand to wherever you are watching and listening from all over the world uh, as as has been stated my name is Pat Spellman uh, and I guess the the I'm very nervous and I'll tell you why because so far everybody I've heard from today has heard doctor in front of their name and uh, I don't so um, my link to this COPUP or this forum I suppose uh, from my perspective is that I serve on a board here in New Zealand, which is the Diabetes Foundation of Aotearoa, our job is basically uh, to uh, promote and enhance the presence of, you know, um, uh, options as opposed to ultimatums as it, as it pertains to diabetes. Uh, and uh, my role in our organization is to help guide the narrative on messaging uh, and ensure that particularly Māori and Pacifica people uh, understand the very real repercussions of diabetes uh, and how uh, diabetes uh, isn't a life uh, or death sentence rather, uh, mind the, the abrupt kind of tone to that statement, but it certainly is something that that is quite relevant to me. Um, th this topic uh, triggered me for a few reasons. One is because COVID-19 is obviously very familiar ground for us at the moment in New Zealand, we're in our third lockdown uh, and we're still currently in lockdown in Auckland, which means, you know, access to some of the uh, options to combat diabetes um, don't exist. We can't play team sports. We can't get out and engage with people. We don't have access to, um, you know, the ability to uh, come together as a community and, and grow our own food and, and, and do the things that our, um, our tupuna or our ancestors as Māori people would say taught us how to do in order to try and combat things like these diseases. So it's been very hard and that would be the first example I can think of in terms of the impact COVID-19 has had on diabetes here in New Zealand. The second thing is uh, obesity, that, that key word there is something that's very relevant to me as somebody who is currently, you know, working through a, a journey 
journey or a process of trying to become a healthier version of myself. And it's certainly something that has plagued my people, or Māori and Pacifica people, for as long as I've been alive, which is you know, 31 years. I, he I heard that I was going to be sort of speaking or referring to young people today, which was also very exciting for me as somebody who still classifies himself as young, although every time I discover a new grey hair, it kind of uh, dampens the spirit. Uh, but uh, diabetes and young people, Pacifica and Māori people particularly, uh, very important um, uh, areas of emphasis for me. Uh, my role, as I said, with the Diabetes Foundation of Aotearoa here in New Zealand is to find a way to, to articulate options so that our people um, understand that there are there are various ways to uh, mitigate the, the very real repercussions of this brown people killer, which is how I refer to it here in New Zealand. So I guess what I can contribute to the conversation today, and I'm hoping that there might be some non-medical questions uh, in our uh, panel discussion a little bit later on, is, is um, you know, the impact that COVID-19 and obesity, I guess, has on, on diabetes from a Māori and Pacifica standpoint, how we've been able to create, you know, Indigenous, um, indigenous uh, solutions for uh, a colonial issue, as far as sort of I'm concerned, and, and a lot of the the, um, the challenges that we're having to overcome as it pertains to diabetes for Māori and Pacifica people, and, and particularly for young people, and especially now during COVID-19, uh, finds us thinking back to how our ancestors or our tipuna uh, would approach situations that were foreign to them prior to colonization and, and the incorporation of, of uh, different folks into our, uh, our lands, we had natural remedies for a lot of these things. And so now it's trying to find a way to make relevant new, new technology and new ideas and new medicines and new approaches to uh, indigenous mindset. So that's been a very real challenge uh, for us as a, as a forum, but, but also I guess for me and my community. So um, yeah, looking forward to, as I said, uh, providing some different perspective that maybe not necessarily medical based or, or, or based on research or, or, um, or, or a thesis, but, but certainly based on real world and, and uh, real life experience. I am obese. I do have um, a very real link to diabetes. Both of my parents have diabetes, so we mitigate that every single day. Uh, for a long time, I was pre-diabetic and only through, you know, finding new active ways to engage in my community have I been able to, to go from being on the on the home stretch to diabetes to someone who, who can now say that I'm no longer in that danger zone. So being able to provide some clarity around messaging and, and, um, and a real sort of layman's term approach has been really uh, beneficial for me in the, in the mahi or the work that I'm involved in. So yeah, that, that's me in a nutshell. Um, so again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of this and to, and to provide a, uh, a Māori and Pacifica skew to this. Um, and, and as uh, many that have said on this before me, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, the people of Aotearoa, himihi uh, tahi te whānau mā o Aotearoa. So just mihi to our our um, Indigenous people here and acknowledge those who are on this call from all over the world that also, like me, have links to, to their ancestors or their tupuna and are keen to explore ways that we can keep our people around a little bit longer, which I'm hoping will, will eventuate as, as, as a result of some of the learnings on this call. So kia ora, looking forward to your questions and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thank you so much, Pat, and it's such an important perspective to have included in the panel here today. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to the Q&A as well. Um, and next, if we could have uh, Dr. Louise Barr, your opening remarks. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and um, welcome. I'm speaking from Sydney, um, and I'm um, from on the land of the Darug speaking people. And it's great to hear people from different parts of the world and to recognise the the many different forms of wisdom that people bring. Pat, I want to just comment that the word doctor literally means teacher. You're a great communicator and you taught us something. So you too are a doctor in that very real sense of what the word doctor means. Okay, folk, I'm, I'm a paediatrician. I work in the area of um, managing, managing children and young people with obesity. I also work in the area of obesity prevention. I'm also president-elect of the World Obesity Federation and in that role have a bit more of a global view of this issue. Um, the World Health Organization describes obesity as 
one of the world's most blatantly visible yet most neglected public health problems. Others have described it as the millennium disease. Now these are strong and emotive words indeed. I want us all to recognize that it is a major health issue. I believe it's a significant chronic relapsing disease. It affects people in low and middle income countries as well as in high income countries and children and young people as well as adults. And it also has a profound impact on people on many other non-communicable diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. Now, in data put together by the World Obesity Federation in its Atlas of Global, Obesity, uh, Global Childhood Obesity, it documented that the countries in the world with, which were most affected in terms of percentage number of people affected by obesity, children and young people affected by obesity, the top 10 were Pacific Islands. Um, if we look at the next layer down, then we include other countries such as the Middle East, um, Caribbean, uh, South America, and um, some other parts of the world. But many, many parts of this world are affected. If we look into the future, then work that uh, World Obesity Federation did with the um, uh, NCD risk collaboration showed that by 2030, um, we expect that there will be uh, 42 countries with more than a million children and adolescents affected by obesity. Of those, 35 are low and middle income countries and 10 are in Asia. And the top two in the world are China and India. Number four is Indonesia and not far behind are Pakistan and Bangladesh. So these, uh, now, of course, that those are countries with large numbers of people, but I think we traditionally think of um, undernutrition as being an issue in many Asian countries, but the reality is that the double burden of malnutrition is alive and well, particularly in the area of Asia, and that obesity affects many children and young people around the world. I will briefly comment about COVID impacts. Um, we have no data really from my country, but we mainly have data from Northern Hemisphere countries from in terms of children and young people. So we know in adults that there has been an increased prevalence of obesity in quite a number of countries that experienced significant lockdowns. Um, and this has been documented in children and adolescents in the USA, in China, and in some parts of Europe. And we believe that this relates to issues to do with changed food uh, delivery systems, um, increased sedentarism, decreased opportunities for physical activity and living with stress. I think we can all relate to that. Now, how do we deal with this issue? Um, I've just told you it's highly prevalent and particularly in the Asia Pacific region. The World Obesity Federation has come up with the acronym ROOTS, R-O-O-T-S. And the first R is recognize. Recognize obesity is a chronic multifactorial disease. It can't be relegated to something that's just related to individual personal responsibility. It's something that's a significant illness and a significant disease. And so we need to recognize it. The second O is for obesity monitoring and surveillance. We don't know what we don't measure. We need to measure height, length and height and weight. We need to document that and to actually identify prevalence of obesity in our populations. So we need to monitor and survey this issue. The second O is obesity prevention strategies. And I'll come back to talk about that. The second T is treatment of obesity, accessible to all, and I'll come back to that. And the S is a systems-based approach to obesity management and prevention. So looking at environmental, social, and commercial roots of obesity. I'll briefly talk about prevention we need to think in terms of very broad approaches to prevention. We cannot just think, important as it is, we can't just think about anticipatory guidance with the child and the parent in that nice context. You know, this is what you should do to try to avoid obesity. Important as that is, we must think much further beyond and we must think about the upstream influences on obesity and tackling those, the commercial determinants that the Minister for Health talked about the profound influence of food marketing and uh, 
pricing and, and uh, availability, but also the changes in motorised transport and in physical activity and green spaces in many of our places. All of these have a profound impact, especially on children and young people. Let me also briefly talk about treatment. For those who are affected by obesity, and I hope I've just told you there's actually quite a number of people who are affected, we need to provide treatment for them. We can't just say, eat less, exercise more. Last thing we should say. And our health systems in basically every country are ill-prepared to manage these. Most countries do not have data on the impact of obesity in our health systems. Most health professionals are untrained in the management of people with obesity. We need to think about um, universal health coverage because it's such a widespread issue and the importance of primary health care. Even though I work in a tertiary centre, we really need to equip primary health care to be able to do this well. Yes, of course, it includes anticipatory guidance and management of overweight and mild obesity, but we also need to think about management of more severe obesity and obesity associated with diabetes and those who may need more um, aggressive forms of treatment, access to bariatric surgery or medications as needed. Um, importantly, in all of these, we need to address weight bias. We need to destigmatize obesity and we need to treat people affected by obesity with respect. Folk, I will leave it there. I look forward to talking with you further um, in the um, breakout groups and in the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Um, yeah, very important points about the disproportionate effects of obesity in low and middle income countries and just the way how we need to uh, think about it uh, to try to eradicate it. Um, I would like to remind the audience that you can submit your questions um, through the chat if you have any. Um, yeah, thank you. So please use the chat function to submit your questions and we'll try to address them if as time permits. Um, oh, go ahead, Dr. Raza. Um, thank you for a very nice presentation, uh, Louise. And I would like to add that uh, we have done a very uh, comprehensive survey on the risk of uh, NCDs in, in the province. And uh, I completely agree with your comment of double burden, and now I call it triple burden with pandemic, uh, that uh, we found that in children uh, between 1 to 15 years, uh, the malnutrition was in the range of 45 to 50 percent in the province of Sindh that I live in. Uh, but on the other hand, there were 10 percent children, almost 9 to 10 percent children who were overweight. So, you know, there was a very clear evidence of a double burden, even in the poorest community because of the lack of physical exercises, the wrong choices of food. And we also looked at the BMIs of the mother. And the BMI of mothers also, even in the, in the communities, was 27% uh, of them will, were overweight and 17% of them were in the frank obese category. So it's, it's a very serious issue. And of course, we, we all know the, the, the implications of uh, obesity in the, in, again, a pandemic of a type 2 diabetes and, and, and heart diseases and so on and so forth. So very important to realize that I, as, as you said, what you don't measure, you don't know. So we need to start really on the war footing, measuring everybody, weighing everybody, and then try to tackle it. Thank you so much. If I might just comment, I had a wonderful PhD student from Indonesia called um, Chut Nervianti Rakmi, who worked with me and Professor Mu Lee in the Sydney School of Public Health for a number of years. And we use, she used data from um, the Indonesian Family Life Survey, uh, which had been collected over many, many years, and um, wrote a number of really great epidemiological studies that really documented the rise in across Indonesia of, um, of increased overweight and obesity prevalence, at the same time that there was a decrease in the prevalence of under, under weight, under uh, underweight, as well as stunting. Still at, you know, the stunting in particular was still at about one in three of the community, but it actually come down. So, you know, so highlighting that Indonesia was dealing with both health issues at the same time. And of course, we're not 
they're also thinking about micronutrient deficiencies. She looked at um, data across the ASEAN countries, so the Southeast Asian countries, and also documented widespread prevalence of uh, that double burden of nutrition in children and young people. Um, the WHO has talked about, um, talks, has some really great resources talking about double duty actions, a lot of things promoting breastfeeding, healthy infant feeding, um, complementary feeding, avoiding that sort of marketing. Um, these are all really important strategies in being able to deal with that issue. Great, thank you so much for that insight. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat. Um, I will get to the first one that we got and then go to um, Aman. Uh, so the first question we got is obesity prevention tends to be lower priority for governments despite who recognition um, of its significance but neglected public health issue. What are some advocacy strategies to encourage national governments to invest in and take leadership in obesity prevention? And Did you anybody? want to do it? Yeah, yeah. go ahead, Dr. Barr. Um, some folk, uh, folk, I'd recommend you look at the World Obesity Federation website for some strategies and some ideas because there's some great resources there. Um, very nicely, fortunately, over the last few months, I think WHO has become very interested once again in the issue of, um, of obesity, in large part because of COVID impacts. We know that um, COVID severity uh, was far more common in adults who had obesity than, you know, it was the second risk factor after, um, after increased age. So um, it put the issue of obesity front and centre front and centre again for WHO. And so it's actually refocused on this issue. And there's quite a lot of work, including with the International Diabetes Federation and others, um, looking at, um, you know, in terms of advocacy within WHO. But so please go and look at the World Obesity Federation website because there's some great resources there. I'd, that whole issue there that I talked about, obesity monitoring, being able to say the issue, document the issue is a really important issue. Um, the voices of people living with obesity are really important. Um, and because you have to get away from this concept of individual responsibility, because we're actually looking at physiological responses to what I believe has become a pathological environment in many places. And we need to support, we need to change that environment and we can't just expect individuals to make change. I'll let others make some other comments if they wish. Yes, I would like to uh, just add a little bit uh, that it's very important and it has started to happen, but especially in the, in the lower middle income countries, uh, the NCD were not initially seen as the priority because of the in a huge load of infectious diseases and malnutrition and all that. But now a realization has set in a number of uh, uh, NCD uh, stations and, and within the Ministry of Health, uh, they have started making departments. So I think that's where the, the, the onus should be that the government should start specifically thinking about the NCDs, set up the desk within the health department, looking at the NCDs separate from the other health issues, of course, that, they, that, they, that are addressed in the lower and middle income countries. Number of pediatric associations, including the IPA, and, and uh, I'm very pleased Dr. Aman is here, and I would say hi to him. That uh, within the Asia Pacific uh, Pediatric Association, and every individual country's pediatric association have uh, identified uh, the importance of NCD, despite the uh, heavy burden of infections in in our own areas. Uh, so I think the first thing is first things first. Uh, the ministry, the governments, the, the, the bit bigger uh, associations have to uh, set up a desk and set up the uh, place where NCDs are addressed separately. And then, of course, obesity is, is, is part of the uh, one of the major things that will be addressed through that. Thank you. I think for me, um, and particularly from a New Zealand standpoint, there's sort of two, two points that I'm thinking of in my head right now in regards to this specific question. It's, it's uh, obesity in itself is, is almost like a taboo subject, particularly with uh, Māori and Pacifica people. You're ashamed to be obese, therefore you are, uh, you are not inclined to want to engage in options uh, that could potentially help alleviate yourself mm -hmm. 
uh, and others of the of the the challenges faced as a result of of obesity. And because you're almost um, obese shamed into thinking that actually you have the power to control your own destiny, you don't feel as though you can be comfortable in reaching out for advice or for support to alleviate um, uh, the the challenges. So. Uh, some feedback that I provided in a forum a couple of years ago and, and then again uh, very recently in, in my capacity as a, as a member of the Diabetes Foundation uh, board was, was simply provide an engagement level on many different attributes that contribute to obesity as the problem or, or the challenge. Um, because if, if, you, if you, Chuck, we want your feedback on, on how to... Uh, fix obesity on a billboard nobody's engaging in the same way that if you were to say help us create a cure for cancer or let's work on how we can fix xyz because those are all medical problems and they're not our fault but because i'm fat it's my fault therefore um, i'm less in inclined mm -hmm. to engage in that process so that's i guess the first piece of feedback and and i'm and i can only speak on myself and my family and my friends some of which go through this problem so that's the first thing i've been we call it fucker iti in te reo maori which is a phrase used to suggest you are embarrassed or ashamed to engage in that process so that's the first thing i, I would uh, r remove the shame aspect of of any engagement um you know, process, if that was the advice I was giving to a government. And I guess the same could be said for diabetes. We we have this, um, this fascination here in New Zealand that diabetes is a death sentence. And that if you are, uh, if you suffer from diabetes, it's a totally preventable disease. And because you've got it, it's your fault. Therefore, you need to navigate this journey yourself. And uh, until we can provide options as opposed to ultimatums uh, as it pertains to diabetes and the the space then um, governments any government regardless of whether you're in New Zealand or Nambia are going to have issues um, you know uh, clearly articulating some opportunities to prosper in that space so just my thoughts on that question it's a really good question thank you for asking it uh, yes, so I guess, uh, Aman, you have your hand raised. I can go to you now. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, Annie, I think I agree to Jamal. Hi, Jamal, how are you? And Louis, and also I agree to Pat. And well, I would like to share also, uh, yeah, we're talking about obesity. And when we see the data from low middle income country, we're talking about double burden, maybe triple burden. But we should go back to what we have been doing with the SDG point number two and point number three. Point number two, actually, we have to decrease to overcome stunting and wasting. This is the most problem. Even the definition of stunting and wasting in a lot of countries, especially low middle country, they use double WHO growth chart. I made my own chart in Indonesia, but still a lot of people, even the government, they use WHO. So if we still keep using WHO, what we see is all children, as long as they are short, below minus 2 SP, regardless they are obese or normal weight, a lot of people in all the country, they keep giving these children food until they become overweight and obese. This is point number two. They don't see the point number three that we have to decrease non-communicable disease mortality from one third. So there is no call, you know, uh, relation between these two points of the uh, SDG. Uh, yeah. uh, this is the first one. And the other thing, in a lot of countries, especially low middle income countries like Indonesia, yeah, of course, like Pakistan, yeah, I'm just uh, uh, come from the same region with the Jamal uh, from Asia Pacific. We have a really high number of low bulk weight, a UGR, small for gestation. And they keep giving a lot of food and milk for this kind of baby for catch up. But finally, about 10 to 15% of them, the data, they still short, but they become obese. So. This is no awareness of this. So we have to tell also 
WHO right now. Before uh, we close the SDG uh, 2030, that this has become dangerous. One program with the other program, this is not related. And we just want to decrease stunting about giving food. Nothing about seeing, you know, about normal weight and obese children with short people. This is the definition of stunting. Actually, the definition of stunting, short children with malnutrition. But they forget about the, the, the malnutrition and also the, the wasting. So I hope this lot of workshop like this, MCD, collaboration with APA and all society, we have to give recommendations also for young people. They have to speak in all the uh, country. Yeah, I spent a lot of time with my uh, Minister of Health. You heard from uh, Mr. Gunadi Sadikin. He's a banker, but he wants to listen to us. That's why, you know, when the Minister of Health, when the government, they don't want to listen, this is going to be a problem. But also WHO, they have to listen. Because I was also in the part of the, the WHO with the NCD uh, meeting about two or three days ago. A lot of people just saying about NCD in adult. Prevention, prevention, but they don't see from the children, from the industry. How they're giving a lot of you know, sugar and a lot of food industry, uh, et cetera, something like that. So having said that, I think with this workshop, after this, NCD child, yeah, APA, and also CLAN, we have to make recommendations yeah, to the WHO and to all the government. This is all champion. A lot of leader here. You're going to be the agent of change. You're going to be the champion, right? Thank you, Amy. Thank you for the very inspirational oh, words and the necessity of having the insight of people in the communities talking and uh, say, like speaking up about their experiences. Uh, we, I think we have time for maybe uh, one more question. We have two questions in the chat addressed to Pat. Uh, one is, what are some strategies you found effective to engage Maori people to promote healthy lifestyles? And what factors are important for Maori health from your perspective? And has the New Zealand government had a positive impact? Maori people, I think, like most Indigenous people, are very family orientated, um, and that can be both a good and a bad thing because it's it's bad from a systemic point of view. We we learn traits from those before us, before them, before them. So, if mum and dad were pretty rough in terms of their diet and lack of activity and these types of things, generally that gets passed down, right? So that's not a it's not a new problem, but it certainly is a common one with, with Māori and Pacifica people. Um, on the flip side of that, from a good perspective, his family is everything. He uh, he 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 tangata, he tangata, he tangata, which is a Māori proverb for uh, what is the most important thing in the world, it is people. Um, and that, I guess, translates to whānau is everything or family is everything. So uh, one of the, the best, I guess, combats to some of the challenges uh, that obesity and diabetes, because frankly, with Māori and Pacifica people, they're one and the same, um, is, is approaching it from a, from a whānau uh, point of view, from a family perspective. It takes a village, right? And that, and that sort of... Um, that analogy uh, translates to Māori people, Pacific Islanders, it, it translates to most people that are family oriented. So some of the successes that uh, the New Zealand government, particularly the most recent government led by Jacinda Ardern, have been providing a bit of autonomy around how Māori providers and Māori DHBs and, and Māori doctors and GP clinics and such can provide context to the circumstances and the repercussions of diabetes and or obesity. So providing a Māori skew on a very real world issue that was foreign to Māori people prior to you know, as early as, as the 1980s, it was it was a very a different world pre sort of 75 in New Zealand anyway. And, and so a lot of the issues that we have from an obesity and a, and a diabetes perspective from a Māori and a, and a Pacifica lens have been have been only, you know, prevalent in, in the last sort of that, that short, short period. So as we've learned over the last few terms with government, 
is giving some autonomy to the messaging because I'm unlikely to get anything from someone who doesn't look like me, sound like me, dress like me, live like me, come from the same place that I come from. The messaging is foreign to me, therefore, so is the challenge and so is the solution. I'm not going to, to hear or embrace or, or take anything from someone who I'm not familiar with because, and this is the other thing with Māori and Pacifica people, is that if we don't trust you, we don't trust your message. So unfortunately, because of the results of, you know, the dawn raids for our Pacifica people, colonization for Māori people, when it's a crown message, we don't trust it. So the, the, the greatest lesson that we've heeded from the last sort of uh, 15 years is that the, uh, the, the, the greatest success stories from a diabetes and obesity prevention standpoint has been ensuring that the messaging comes from people that we trust. And that is us. So that is Fano order providers, which is people that are connected to local iwi or hapu, uh, that are that are GP clinics, that are Māori doctors uh, doing doing uh, talanoa or, or um, wānanga or basically forums like this in thing places like marae or local schools or community halls that our people are familiar with. It's the equivalent of sitting around the fire uh, and having a conversation as we would back in the day. Uh, and, and that's been a huge combat to providing context to, to a lot of the challenges. And, and because sometimes that's the greatest um, hindrance to progress is that we simply don't understand because we don't appreciate or, or trust the communicator. The message is the same. It's just put in words and said in ways that we understand. It certainly worked for me, you know, um, in December, 2019, I weighed 227 kilos. Uh, so uh, yesterday I weighed in at 174. And the, pro the progress of that health journey for me has been ensuring that I'm communicating to and receiving communication from people that I trust, people that look like me, sound like me, dress like me, navigate in the same circles because uh, with respect, if a white man who dresses in a suit stands at the front of the room and tells me all of the, the things that are going to make my life better, I'm switching off straight away. Don't trust you. The last white man that stood in my house was a bailiff and took that dad to court. You know, like these are very real scenarios for Māori people. And the government have, uh, have heard this. And so it's certainly something that we've seen in South Auckland, which is, which is the lowest socioeconomic community in New Zealand uh, and, and is where our trust for the Diabetes Foundation is based. We find that the, the greatest successes in our community have been because we have uh, attached the message to messengers that have uh, a tangible grasp with the people. And they understand the challenges because they've lived them, they've breathed them. When I stand up and talk about obesity and diabetes, people listen to me because they know I know what I'm talking about, not because I have, um, you know, uh, formal qualifications in the matter, because I don't, as, as we learned, I studied broadcasting and have a degree in PR, but my my link to these challenges uh, because I treaded that water and climbed that mountain. Therefore, I feel as though I kind of know a little bit about what I'm talking about. So, so that's how we've how we've articulated these messages in regards to these two kaupapa, or these two topics to our people, and and the government, to their credit, have done a really good job uh, at ensuring that the communication is key and and has been very clear because. The message really hasn't changed because there was nothing wrong with the message in terms of how to overcome some of the challenges we're facing. It was always the messenger. And so now the government, uh, particularly led, as I said, by Jacinda and, and her team have realized, well, we call it mana motuhake in te reo Māori, which is essentially autonomy over our message and our, and our, our vision. So being able to put everything, take real world issues and, and park our challenges and put them through a Māori lens so that our people feel as though they've been communicated uh, with respect and dignity, uh, then I think you'll find that uh, better results are, uh, will come as a result of that. So I hope that answered. That was a very long-winded way of answering the question, but I hope it helps. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, that was a great answer. Uh, very uh, insightful about how trust plays a huge role into who people listen to um, and how they take the message. Uh, so thank you so much. I think that's all the time, unfortunately, that we have for questions.